So I added this to Hack Notice. We added every single escort site into our, our system. So if you're using our browser extension or anything like that, you can see when your escort service of preference has been broken into, which it most likely has. Very important if you use an escort site. Wait, Hack Notice offers escorts? Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Bourbon and Data Breaches, where we cover five of the most interesting data breaches of this last week and one of our favorite bourbons. I'm Steve. Howdy, I'm Shu. Nikki. Brandon. The topic number one, your car is spying on you and a CBP contract shows the risks. So U.S. Customs and Border Protection purchased technology that vacuums up reams of personal information stored inside cars according to a federal contract reviewed by The Intercept, illustrating the serious risks in connecting your vehicle and your smartphone. What do you guys think about the implications here? Did they say what they can get from a car? It was um, who's going into your car, which doors are opened, uh, where you're going. Uh, you know, how like do how they know who's going car? into my car? Like that was that must not be my car because my car has doors and it goes places. Brandon's car has no computers, so Brandon's car barely has has gasoline in it. You're, you're right on the gas thing, but all cars since '96, I believe, have that uh, that OBD2 system in it, and uh, I think all all sorts of information about. Uh, everything in the car goes over that uh, that bus so your your seat sensors so if you've got a passenger in there uh that's going to go over the bus to to deal with the the seatbelt uh light and whatever else so i would worry about this if i was in a tesla right because like there's so much metadata or any other smart car um but i have a very dumb car I guess I guess I'd worry about this for the car that I get in like ten years. Um, I mean, it's gonna happen, right? the The more you use something, the more metadata it's likely to collect. Yeah, the article kind of implied that this forensics kit that this company sold um, relies on these cars grabbing all the data from your phone, including GPS data as you travel. So um, does it surprise me? Absolutely not. Um, yeah, and it, apparently this kit can go get this data easily. Now, what my takeaway was, um, and I was kind of clued in by the by the by this contract here, it was only 450 grand, which doesn't seem to be that much, which says to me, I think given car makers history on security, this is probably very easy data to grab. So if a company can do it and they're only selling it to um, law enforcement, I think that's kind of bogus. And I would not be surprised if some hacker is able to make some homemade kit in the future, plug it into the OBD system and grab whatever is in there too. It's probably not encrypted. I yeah. I will eat my hat if a car other than a Tesla encrypts user data. Mm -hmm. um, is it, I'm pretty sure the Canvas is, is not is specifically not encrypted. Yeah, uh, just by standard. Yeah. I I guess I would worry if I was um, if I was doing something super shady and they could get like when I last stopped, right? Like, it's like, oh, he drove 54.3 miles. So let's make a radius and figure out what's what's there. But I'm not doing that and I don't care. So I don't think the average consumer should really be worried about this. If you're, yeah. if you're doing shady stuff with your car, but then again, what can you do about it? There's, there's no solution here. Don't plug in your phone. I mean, that's a simple... Mm. That's a simple thing is don't plug in your phone. How many times have we been in, in rental cars and see the old renter like synced their address? Oh, uh, well, does it do over Bluetooth or is it only when you plug it in with the, with the cord thing? Uh, with the cord thing, I would say that you're guaranteed that the 
you're guaranteed to suck in, to have all your data sucked in. Bluetooth, um, don't know, very interesting. Maybe Bluetooth uh, is would honor just the permissions you give it, like contacts, recent calls. So I only do Bluetooth for uh, phone calls and music. And uh, it does ask me for permission for my contacts. So right. that's, that I, I either say this, that or I don't. Uh, if it is the cord, then we do have a solution, which is uh, uh, condoms. You can get USB condoms to make sure that only power, no data goes through. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I guarantee you that once you plug in with USB, all bets are off and devices can suck in data. Unless you wear a condom. Unless you wear a condom, yes, yeah. Put a condom There's, on your Bluetooth. Yeah. There's been interesting discussions on whether CarPlay will allow you to do that too. And CarPlay, maybe CarPlay and the Android equivalent, people are hopeful that it's safer um, because theoretically, I believe those are just used to display on your dash as a display for CarPlay, but nobody knows for sure. So. Uh, okay, let's move on to topic number two. Brazil's Rio Grande the Sul court system hit by Revil ransomware. We are talking about them every week, but this is pretty new. Um, Brazil's Tribunal de Justiça do Estado do Rio Grande do Sul was hit by a Revil ransomware attack a couple of days ago that encrypted employees' files and forced the courts to shut down their network. The evil is busy. They are I busy. Like said, uh, I think, like you said, like every week we're talking about them. It's not like they go make some uh, ransomware attack, gain about twenty million dollars, and then get drunk and party for a couple months. They're next week. They're right back in it. Well, these disclosures only happen if the people they are ransoming don't pay. So it makes you wonder about all the other gangs that don't disclose often? Are they just making bank? Um, I found, uh, so I was watching Ransomware this week and I was uh, particularly interested in how many we got. And ReEvil makes a lot of splashy headlines, but Avadin hit like a dozen people this last week. <laughs> So I think in terms of sheer, sheer numbers, Re-Evil is not the highest. They just hit the highest uh, targets in terms of like newsworthy targets. Like they, they hit the Apple supplier um, and they also provide the color commentary. Have you read some of these uh, disclosures, Brandon? I have not. Re-Evil, uh, at least one of the people that posts on Re-Evil uh, he likes to joke around with his victims. Um, and I mean, it is, uh, he provides some very vulgar yet very funny suggestions to these businesses. We have come to the, our working theory is that there are multiple people writing for Re-Evil because their personality kind of comes through in different releases. And we want to meet the funny one, have a drink with them or her. So I got the uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, hack cache from Hack Notice up on my screen. And I do not see um, anything funny in it. So this must have been the unfunny one. This is the one that's all business. Yeah. The one they, for the Apple supplier, Qantas, was all business. I think they really want to get paid for that one. And that dude in Southern California. Oh, yeah. The SIBA IT director. Did, IT they, director. did they ask a specific number for their, their ransom from the court? Why did uh, I think it was 5 million? Check. It was, I think it was 5 million. 50, 50 million. Oh, no, that was Acer. Acer was 50 million. Yes, this was 5 million. Re-Evil demanded 5 million to decrypt the files. Great. Well, Nikki, I think it's time for a bourbon break. Shu, what do you have for us? 
Um, so today I'm checking out Maker's Mart Private Selection Blueberry Yum Yum. Now, I got this on the shelf at my local Total Wine here in Washington. You can see Total Wine uh, <laughs> Washington on it. Yeah, um, I was intrigued by this and I'm standing in front of the boat of the aisle and I'm trying to Google, trying to see any information I could on, trying to find any information I could and I could not. And so I asked the dude there, I mean, I said, I asked him, what's the deal with this bourbon? I can't find any information on it. And Maker's Mark has this program where uh, individuals or organizations can buy barrels and they'll just make that, they'll just age that barrel specifically for the organization and apparently that's what Total Wine in Washington did. And they call this Blueberry Yum Yum. And um, which is interesting because Blueberry Yum Yum is a Southern dessert. And Washington, I believe is not a Southern state. So- Jury's out on that, but no, I, I don't. <laughs> it's South of Canada. Does that count? It, it is South of Canada. Canada. If you go- east a little bit over the mountains culturally it's pretty close so um yeah so let's and this is an unopened bottle right i just saw you rip off is the wax that i just ripped off here and so um the the so so we're getting a virgin tasting here we're getting a virgin tasting the sales associate said it does sort of taste fruity he was like, eh, it's okay. It's pretty good. It's interesting, but didn't knock his socks off. So let's see what I think of it. Really earning that commission, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the dude was pretty knowledgeable about other bourbons, especially local bourbons. So I was, I was pretty impressed with him. Um, let's see, 110 proof, 110.5 proof. Did a seared French cuvee, Maker's Mark 46. Oh, this is a staff profile here uh four stabs of rest interesting of it is not cask strength it's 46 strength it is yes yes oh. so yeah I, I i think the stab profile is their um their their stick is that they have several stabs and they just like put it into the barrel with the bourbon so three baked american pier one seared french cuvee one maker's mark 46 which i love four roasted french mocha one toasted french spice so uh dated july 2020 let's see how this is do you think that's when they put in bottle or do you think that's when they started the second um aging process i think it's when they that's a good question but i thought it was uh that was when they bottled it so because I, I think regular makers, correct me if I'm wrong, is aged for two years. Right. Yeah. Um, I assume they re-age it for another one year. Probably. There is no statement about age here. But is it a straight so Kentucky bourbon? Is does not say. I think straight Kentucky bourbons have to be two years. I believe it is. barrel with the see, ten maker's mark. Stabs. see unlike so, most distillers maker's mark is, isn't satisfied simply by sending a clock that's why we age to taste not time it usually takes between six and seven years for the whiskey to be ready well six yeah, so, to seven that's pretty good yeah that's pretty good so let's see how this is this is a um, oh spilled a little bit um looks like a regular little slightly <laughs> darker makers here um smells kind of like heavier proof um it is a heavier proof there is a burn um not a terrible one but uh it gets you and i i do taste the fruitiness of it it is um i don't know if i would identify it as blueberry but there is certainly a fruity very fruity forward flavor it is a little bit spicy. 
a lot of the flavor profiles we've talked about before, like caramel, some of the chocolate or taste. I, I, I don't really get that with this. Um, it is sort of fruit, fruit forward. So um, it's, it's, it's a pretty good bourbon. So um, yeah, it's a very pleasant bourbon. Is it a hundred dollar bourbon? No, <laughs> no. That's the bourbon break. Well, Nikki, what do you have for us next? Let's move on to the third topic we have today. Third topic we'll be covering actually came as a user submit. Um, so it's a dark network dumped database. It's on GitHub. Uh, user submit, and it's all, well, not all, but it is heavily centered around um, escort sites being hacked and, uh, we're, and we're looking at a lot government of sites and escort sites so <laughs> yeah. you'll Those see a lot sites. of these are government sites which is very common but if you show your screen again nikki i'll let you cue that up um there's one file in there specifically called escort sites near the top um one thing that's incredibly fascinating there you go it's right under the three circle church.com Hi, threecirclechurch.com. Um, enjoy the press. But they've, they've got like over 20 different escort sites. Uh, I saw like Scottsdale escorts.com, oh, escorts.com, San Diego escorts.com. So there's got to be a really, got to be a few people that are pretty uh, uh, worried about this. Um, oh, we need to get that Scottsdale dump. So what's, what's really fascinating is this is not the first time hackers have used GitHub as a way to disclose breaches or even a way to disclose ransomware. There is a ransomware that was open sourced sitting on GitHub that GitHub had up for, uh, I don't know, at least a month. Um, what do you guys think about that? That was gonna be my first question was that, you know, when you're wanting to make a statement and kind of show your victims that you're meaning business, I guess there is no preferred way, right? Like there's no uh, flow where you should be posting things. You shouldn't just set up your own. Scroll back. Or... I just saw that dreams Austin one and dreams Austin two is in this. Get those two dreams, Dallas. Oh, these are disappointing. Uh, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> Wait, Austin Dreams ones. Girl Fran San Francisco has Dreams Austin. That's just confusing. I guess for all the dream girls that moved from San Francisco to Austin. So the Dreams domain, I mean, it, it's pretty clear what happened. This has happened before. We've seen this. The um, uh, It was basically one site that one company that localized their content, they use the same platform, same code throughout. So it's, uh, it appears to be multiple, multiple hacks. Um, when in fact, there's probably just one vulnerability somewhere and allowed the attacker to get in everywhere. So, um, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's kind of the kind of thing is that they, they basically got a skeleton key into the, into the whole platform. I think that GitHub's just going to accept it. Hackers are going to use GitHub. They're going to post stuff up there. It's too hard for them to figure out what is a hacker disclosing hacks versus what, a, what is legitimate code. I, yeah. I, think, I think that they're just going to have to do it. Yeah. Just accept it. And that, those files up on GitHub, that is a MySQL dump of tables. Right. That's it. There's like, there's no way that a machine can say, oh no, this is bad content. Right. GitHub has to actually see that this is, this is not good data. Even All the, the hacker most did advanced, was like, yeah, yeah, even the most advanced machine learning can't, cannot detect that that's something that should not be on GitHub. Yeah. I mean, that was just a list of, from the, from the attacker saying, this is what mm -hmm. we have, but it's code. Looks like. 99.99% of what's yeah, on GitHub, it's, it's code. It's a terminal output. Um, 
I would be curious. So I assume this hacker took a lot of uh, preventative measures and uploaded all that through Tor, but maybe they didn't, which means that GitHub now has that hacker's IP address. So, hey, GitHub, maybe you should take a look into this. Honestly, no one else knows about this. Uh, this was submitted to us by a user of Hack Notice. We went and we grabbed everything. We added it all to Hack Notice. A lot of this was brand new. We, are, we already had a few of these. So we, we funny enough, we had a few of these because we had seen the files back in uh, November. So the hacker released some of the files in November. We got them. We, we already had those in our system, but a lot of these other ones were, were brand new. I don't think anyone knows about this. I, I think that the general media would be very surprised if a, if a hacker was bragging about their exploits um, on GitHub. Okay, moving on to topic number four. Babook closes one shop, switches to Brass? Brass? R-A-A-S? Ransomware as a service? Brass. In a previous chat with a Polish blogger, a Babook spokesperson had indicated that after the Metropolitan Police Department of DC, they would no longer attack state or government entities. So they, I think this story was bigger than what you've just mentioned. They, they're no longer committing ransomware. They said, we're done with ransomware. Um, we're going to be a service platform. So I don't think they're actively going to go out and try to infect people anymore. I think that they're going to be ransomware as a platform, which means they provide the ransomware and they keep uh, evolving it to avoid detection and hackers pay for access to the platform. I think that an article broke down how much they would take, how much the uh, the attackers would take. Mm -hmm. um, how I find this story interesting because we talked about it last week with mm -hmm. the Washington DC uh, attack. Um, don't know if this story is related or what, or it would be interesting to see if it was related. Um, I think it is. I think they're the ones that broke into the DC. It, yeah, they definitely are, but uh, maybe conspiracy theory says that they bit off more than they could chew or something, but it's... Uh, I think it's a testament to the evolution of a marketplace um, uh, or a market in general, and uh, cybercrime is very much a market that's evolving very quickly. Um, they're no longer trying to commit crimes. They're just trying to be a, a service company for criminals. So I think that's a testament to uh, the market itself. It's a $6 trillion market. And we've speculated that the first billion dollar ransomware gang already exists. Uh, if you're a billion dollar ransomware gang and you can outsource the development of ransomware to people that specialize in it, why, why would you not, right? You, you pay a portion of the ransom to Babook and you just got rid of all your dev expenses, so. It's basically like shelling or selling shovels during the gold rush, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's exactly it. They are selling shovels during the gold rush. They're, they're the outsourced call center uh, during the late 90s, right? They're, they are the outsourcing or offshoring for hackers. I mean, but let's be clear here. I mean, Book, they're just as guilty and they're going to get prosecuted if they're going to get caught. But this model greatly reduces their exposure and their risk here. So it's fascinating. Is making ransomware a crime? I mean... Like That's in, a good in, question. In theory, let, like, let's say you're a university professor and you want to study ransomware. Well, I, if you make your own, did you commit a crime? You haven't infected anyone. I, I think the intention is has a lot to do with it. 
And if you're a babook and you're making ransomware and telling people, yeah, go ahead and, and put this ransomware and collect money and babook is still profiting off it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a crime. I, I think and you're a researcher and you're just researching and that's No, that's not a crime. I think intent has a lot to play in U S law, but we have to remember that there's 150 countries on this earth and there's 150 ways to interpret the law. And in some places, software itself is not a crime. And so it, it's definitely a gray area. If you are babook, you could see this as a way to avoid the heat while still making a pretty tidy profit. They definitely have reduced their the heat. They're not the ones going into a network and attacking it. Mm-hmm. So at least at least they're the, they're that. I mean, what if you were an independent contractor writing software and you accidentally wrote ransomware, Brandon? Yeah, Brandon, you accidentally (laughs) wrote ransomware. How does one accidentally write ransomware? You tell us. You're just making modules. Let's say they're like, hey, let's make an encryption module. It's like, okay. Hey, let's make like a file discovery and encryption module. That, okay, that's fine. Let's make uh, some sort of deployment module. Like you, you could boil the frog, if you will. I mean, it sounds like I mean, some of my bad software at some point, like, like after, I, after I leave my current company, like some of my bad software screws everything up and I can fix it because I understand my terrible software. Is that accidental ransomware? Does that count? I can. I, 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 I think. Them. I think that's that's purposeful holding them for ransom. That's a long con. It's <laughs> <laughs> what we call job security. On the topic number five, we'll be covering today. The IRS wants help hacking cryptocurrency hardware wallets. <laughs> hey, IRS, no. What if they promise to do good with the billions no. that they're able to access? How much would you We've guys We've done say? this before. One, the FBI should not be hacking anyone. Two, the IRS should not literally be going into your wallet. Digitally Isn't that or their otherwise. whole purpose? I mean... No. I, yeah. I... I think this is, I don't want to, I think I would, cl- I would be close to calling it a waste of taxpayer money. I think uh, according to the article, what they want um, is not going to happen. They want some reusable tool to get into all these different crypto hardware wallets. And that's just not going to happen. No. Yeah. Good, good luck with that. There's yeah. a guy that has like $300 million in Bitcoin in a hardware wallet and he forgot his password irs if you think there is a way to hack into these wallets someone would have sold it to that guy for like a third of his bitcoins yeah it's uh, yeah the irs was asking for a reusable solution that can be used for all different hardware wallets and that that's just not the way it works you're that not going to get will that will never happen that will never happen the zero days on things like android devices and mac devices or iphone devices they're specifically for one version of hardware one specific point release of an operating system aren't there bigger fish right like didn't Purdue Pharma poison a lot of people for like three billion dollars? Couldn't the yeah, IRS go after them? But they didn't do it in Bitcoin, where it's hidden and it's right. So okay, so so I have two options: go after the mathematically almost impossible low amount of money, or go after the money that's sitting in a bank account committed by someone that's admitted to other crimes Uh, like the irs should be going after high net worth individuals that are not filing their taxes properly and not going after crypto 
I, I don't even think that crypto should be under the IRS's jurisdiction. I don't even think it should be under the FCC's uh, or FTC's. One of the three letter agencies that does uh, stocks um, jurisdiction. FTC? SEC. SEC. F SEC falls under something else though. Treasure. SEC is under treasure. The FTP oh. department should stay away from crypto because... <laughs> Um, it's not a stock. It's treating crypto like a stock is like treating the US dollar like a stock. Like if I hand shoe a dollar, that's not a stock exchange. That's a payment for services rendered. And uh, the, the, the whole argument that it's like, it's not speculative trading, Bitcoin is a coin and I can spend it on stuff. Um, it's not buying and selling of stocks. That's going to be way too complex and way too dumb of a way to look at this. Let's just treat, let's treat all cryptocurrency like um, rubles. It's a dumb currency that's probably going to lose value 99% of the time. The ruble, oh my God. This has been an episode of Bourbon and Data Breaches. If you like what you saw today, please like, follow, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you saw today, fight those other people in the comments section. If you have a bourbon or a breach you'd like us to cover, you can contact us at contact at hacknotice.com. Until next time.